So Michael Fallon has stepped into that role and he joins us now. Very good morning to you. Good morning. Um, we'll go into more detail in a moment, but just tell us about that process of being called into number 10 and told you're going to be in charge of the country's defence budget. Well, it was a complete surprise. You get a phone call asking you to go to uh, number 10 and um, you don't know until you arrive, of course, what, what you're going to be offered or whether you're going to be moved sideways or you demoted. You have no inkling at all. There are no, no, there's no rumours, there's pe not people sort of stuff. priming you. You read stuff in the newspapers, you're told you're old and white, you know, and maybe you haven't got a hope. And then you get, you get a phone call saying, can you come to Downing Street? You didn't get a chance to put a bet on that, Matt. You didn't get a chance to put a bet on it. <laughs> and then you go in and the Prime Minister asks me into the Cabinet room and it's fairly formal and he formal offered me the job and we talked through it. And uh, it's an awesome responsibility, obviously, to be uh, in charge of the nation's defence with our armed forces. And having been in politics for so long, and so long. In there, well, yes. yeah, but, but, but equally have that sort of experience to suddenly be put into this position, how did it personally feel to be given such a huge job? Well, you have to keep learning new things. I mean, I've, I've moved from the Department of Education originally, and then the Department of Business, then the Department of Energy. I, I know how Whitehall works, but of course, there's a huge amount of briefing to, do, to, to, to absorb immediately. Uh, I have to see the had to see the service chiefs immediately, find out what the current issues are in terms of our security, uh, what's happening in Afghanistan, where we're drawing out our troops, what we're doing every day to keep Britain safe. So there's an enormous amount of information to absorb very quickly. Yeah, and further defence cuts? No, I hope not. I think we've seen the we've, we've got the defence budget under control now. We inherited this extraordinary mess where lots of equipment was ordered, but it wasn't properly financed, it wasn't funded. And my predecessor, Philip Hammond, has spent uh, nearly four years sorting all that out now. So we're able to invest in the future. I think you remember a couple of weeks ago, the Queen naming the new aircraft carrier mm -hmm. uh, up in uh, Resyth in Scotland. Um, that's an example of the commitment we're now able to make because we've sorted out the budget and we're um, ordering new submarines now, we're investing, the Prime Minister announced on Monday more into the Special Forces and more on counter-terrorism and we're able to do that because we have taken some very tough decisions okay. about getting the budget under control. Do you think you have been employed as a weapon yourself against UKIP as a Eurosceptic in the Cabinet? Well, I think there are plenty of Eurosceptics. I mean, the public seem to be quite Eurosceptic now. You saw the vote at the European elections. And I think we all want to see Europe reformed, Europe changed, made more competitive, uh, getting away from the old idea of centralising and harmonising everything, and having Europe uh, better able to compete against the rest of the world and if, create if, jobs. So we're the, all slightly Eurosceptic now. If the Conser well, I mean, a lot of people might disagree with you. If the Conservative Party won the next general election and there is a referendum whether to stay in or out of Europe, how would you vote? Well, provided we get the reforms we want, that's the whole purpose of the uh, the choice we now we, we're now embarked on, which is to get the reforms, to get Europe more competitive, so that it gets on to creating jobs, not just harmonising yeah. things. Then you the vote stay. And then putting that choice to the people, getting public consent, and that's the problem at the moment. The public haven't had a vote about Europe for years mm. uh, since before you were born yeah, back would, in 1975. But how would you vote? If we get the reforms we want, I will vote to stay in. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Inter interestingly, there's a lot being talked about as well of the, the arrival and promotion of lots of women yes. uh, to the Cabinet suddenly. Um, it was a surprise to you. Do you think it was a surprise to the women that took their positions as well? No, well, because we've got uh, more women MPs now and some of them become junior ministers. And what's great is to see them coming all the way through now into the Cabinet. There are some young mothers there. Uh, Liz, the cynics would say, though, the cynics would say it's ten, month, ten months before the election and what David Cameron's doing, he's got one eye in the election and appealing to lots of mothers and, that are out there that want to see women in these roles. No, I think you have to refresh the team. A football manager does that, brings people through from the squad into the first team, uh, recruits new players. These are uh, very able women ministers who've been in junior roles so far because they're relatively new in Parliament. And now they've got all the way through into the Cabinet. Nikki Morgan, a young mother in education. Liz trust at the environment. So you've got uh, five women now in the cabinet out of 17 conservatives. That's a third. It's not enough, but it's certainly a start making the cabinet look more like the country that we represent. Okay. Michael Fun, thank you very much. Best of luck with the job. <laughs> thank you.